More than a dozen prominent Washington research groups have received tens of millions of dollars from foreign governments in recent years. Foreign propaganda is all around us. Many of us repeat it every day, and we don't even realize it. Washington becomes a playground for foreign interests, and the interest of the United States citizen gets, gets kind of lost in this. Uh, Qatar is excellent at playing the game. You fund think tanks to put out policy papers that support what you want. And then you fund law firms to sue people you don't like. There's pay to play journalism. Huge amount of foreign funded news and commentary that we all take in as real thoughts and real news coming from real American citizens. The nation of Qatar has historically been a funder of terrorism. Qatar has been a patron of the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamist movements. They've provided financial support for terrorism, for Hamas, for elements of Al-Qaeda, the Taliban. And they spent an untold amount of money in D.C. funding media operations, hiring lobbyists, and they've been tremendously successful. Foreign funding of American government decision-making. It corrupts our democracy. The Russian assault on our election system has prompted new measures to protect your vote. We've been hearing a lot about foreign influence operations, interference and propaganda ever since Trump won the presidency. Russian interference with democratic elections. We've heard about the Trump and Russia collusion conspiracy theory. We've even heard about people like me. In October 2018, Wired Magazine accused me and other journalists of being information terrorists. They insinuated that we were acting on behalf of foreign powers. But as an independent journalist, I've broken major stories. My reporting even forced a congressman to resign. But I've never lobbied on behalf of a foreign nation, unlike the author of that piece. After a bit of research, my team found out that the writer, Molly McHugh, is a registered foreign agent operating in the United States on behalf of the nation of Georgia and perhaps several others. Wired failed to disclose this obvious conflict of interest to their audience. Was she being paid? If so, by whom? What was her real agenda? How often does this happen? And who else is on the payroll in Washington? Jack Posobiec is a correspondent for One America News Network and a former naval intelligence officer. He conducted interrogations of detainees at Guantanamo Bay. He's an expert at influence operations. How you doing, man? Good What's going to see on, you. Man? Good to see you. How are you? Doing well? Doing well? Oh, yes. So why do you think that there's all this talk about Russia? And we know, of course, Russia is running operations in America. We're not naive, but why does anybody talk about, like, Ukraine and Qatar, for example? We never hear about the influence that Qatar has on U.S. foreign policy. When you look at things, the money that's coming in to the U.S., especially U.S. politics, right in this city, when you look at in terms of dollar amounts, the real money isn't coming from Russia. It's coming from China. It's coming from Ukraine. It's coming from Qatar. And then we're talking millions and millions of dollars in some cases. But that's the game, is these people go and take money from other countries and they run uh, articles, they run op-eds, they go on TV programs, they're propagandizing to our people and we do nothing about it. Well, and, and the beauty of it is you don't know that you're sharing foreign propaganda. Here's when I knew how fake the media was, is I found out, I didn't know this myself, he's on Hannity and other Fox News programs, Doug Schoen goes on right. Fox News and he talks about why, you know, why Ukraine is good and Russia is bad. He makes something like tens of thousands of dollars a month for the Ukraine, he's a registered foreign agent, he's on Fox. So I sent that to a bunch of journalists and they go, oh yeah, we all know. And they go, but Fox doesn't disclose that. They don't say he's a registered foreign agent. They go, eh, whatever, there's no story there. And then, of course, I found out that every media outlet plays the same game. Yeah, so one of my favorite ones is AJ+. Plus. Yeah. Now, you've got this, this company that makes viral videos every day. Everybody retweets them. Everybody shares them on Instagram. That's an influence operation. AJ+. Plus. AJ is Al Jazeera+, Plus, completely funded by the government of Qatar. Why are people harping on one when everybody's in on the game. And I think that's because Qatar's paying journalists. I don't have any proof of this, of course. But I think Qatar, through funding the Brookings Institute, people know, hey, this is uh, good cash. So a funny thing actually happened. When I told a political reporter yesterday that um, I was doing an expose in Qatar, 
He said, oh shit, who's paying you? <laughs> I was like, nobody. He's like, oh, come on, man. If you're making a documentary on anything, anything then, then they're like, oh, there must by... be four. They just right. take it for granted. Right. He wasn't even accusing me. He was like, oh, that's really cool. Like, you must be getting paid a lot of money by the Saudis because it's against Qatar. Right. I was like, well, no, but, but that's the first place their head goes. And that's how pervasive foreign money is. I've been more critical of Saudi Arabia than anyone else in the media. And in fact, I wonder, why did they ignore the Saudi Arabia's past behavior? Why did they ignore what happened at 9-11? And in fact, their past funding of terrorism? Why did the media take a sudden interest in Saudi Arabia's efforts at influencing American political affairs? A Washington Post journalist, known for criticizing the Saudi government, was seen entering the Saudi consulate, and then he was never, ever seen again. Saudi Arabia confirms that the journalist Jamal Khashoggi is dead. The de facto Saudi ruler, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, ordered the kill. The barbaric murder of Jamal Khashoggi tells us something important about Saudi Arabia. Why do they care so much about Saudi Arabia now? Why is Saudi Arabia suddenly a target of the mainstream media and the Washington, D.C. establishment? What changed? Why now? Why now? Why now? A lot of this is, um, is being led by former Obama people. The Obama people just will not forgive the Saudis for putting an end to the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring, really what it was, was the toppling of dictatorships, many of which supported the United States in favor of, you know, what it thought was democracy. They were watching Al Jazeera. Hillary Clinton famously praised Al Jazeera as real news. Viewership of Al Jazeera is going up in the United States because it's real news. Al Jazeera is out of Doha and it's always been a product of the Qatari government. A TV channel uh, that is being used in part uh, as a platform by right. extremist or very nefarious political Islamists. So they were watching Al Jazeera and Al Jazeera was showing that everybody in the Muslim world wants to see the toppling of these regimes that supported the United States. So the Obama administration thought, hey, if we support these people's revolutions, then maybe they'll like us. That was a bad bet. You had Egypt fall to the Muslim Brotherhood, you had Tunisia fall to the Muslim Brotherhood, you had Libya fall. It was also a bet that got them crosswise with Saudi Arabia, which was not about to let itself fall to the Muslim Brotherhood. The Obama administration, they'll say, oh, we believe in democracy. Well, democracy often is the Muslim Brotherhood. Qatar has long been a, um, has long had the welcome mat out for the Muslim Brotherhood. And <clears throat> I can't think of um, other countries in the region uh, where that welcome mat continues to be in place in the same way. The Muslim Brotherhood is a jihadist movement. It's an Islamist movement, a political and social movement that wants to rule as a political organization. So it's not just a religious movement. It's fundamentally to take political control over entire countries and to eventually bring about a caliphate, a global caliphate, meaning a, a global Islamist dictatorship that rules all of us. Which, of course, is not really democracy. It's a, you know, as, as we've seen in, in, in Egypt, as we see increasingly in Turkey, it's really a sham democracy based on explicit principles of Islam. <laughs> Anytime you see terrorism being done and, and the, the infrastructure for doing it, raising money, doing propaganda, things like that, the Brotherhood is always there. The Obama people and the Bush people before them were, were, were pushing this line that terrorism is a natural outgrowth of having dictatorship and not having any space for, for politics. Well, it's not really about politics. It's really, at the end of the day, it's about values. It's about what people believe, as opposed to the closed nature of some of these societies. We must be united in pursuing the one goal that transcends every other consideration. That goal is to meet history's great test, to conquer extremism. Trump, I think, you know, to his great credit, saw things in the Middle East very clearly. This was President Trump's Riyadh speech in May of 2017. It was a brilliant speech, a really historic speech. 
This was Trump's first foreign visit as president. He went to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, sort of the heart of the Islamic world, the keepers of Mecca and Medina for all of Islam, to pay a visit to the king and the crown prince. But what he did was kind of like Ronald Reagan and his Berlin Wall speech. Trump went and spoke out harshly against Islamic extremism and exhorting all those Muslim countries, quote, to drive them out, drive them out of your countries, drive them out of their communities, drive them out of your mosques, drive them out of this world. Wipe them out. That's what Trump was saying. That means honestly confronting the crisis of Islamic extremism and the Islamists and Islamic terror of all kinds. Frankly, I thought that the way the president put it in his remarks in Riyadh uh, was pretty good in terms of, you know, let's, let's forget all of the academic details. This is good versus evil. Um, and you know who these people are and drive them out. And what did those Arab leaders say and those Muslim leaders say? They, first, they were dumbfounded. Because historically, everyone in the region at one time has funded terrorism. Well, do you know any major Arab ally that embraces ISIL? I know major Arab allies who fund them. But that was a few years ago. In the past, we depended on the Saudis so much for oil. They were buying our tools, our drilling equipment, our shipping, all of our technology, that's American jobs. That's keeping our economy booming. Are we really going to kick them down for doing that? My view is yes, because they're supporting terrorism and people who meant us harm and did us harm. So Trump gave that very principled speech in the heart of the Islamic world without any apologies at all. And many of them went ahead and did precisely what Trump was hoping to do, except for Qatar, of course. The key person, though, who was so, so supportive of Trump and that speech was the Saudi crown prince, who became the linchpin of our strategy to drive out radical Islamic extremism from the entire world. What has he done with those jihadi clerics, the main jihadi clerics who have been pushing this whole propaganda line for global jihad? He had them sentenced to have their heads chopped off. What about these Saudi billionaires who've been funding all this subversion from terrorism to pro-jihadist curriculum at Georgetown University and elsewhere? He had them rounded up and imprisoned in a fancy hotel, took away billions and billions and billions of dollars of their wealth, and all of a sudden they're pretty quiet. They've been rounding some of these guys up and they've really been a force for the end of extremism. Qatar, on the other hand, has been a patron of the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamist movements. For, for decades. They continue to do so, not only for funding, but also for housing and supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Saudis and the Emiratis kind of just got sick of it. And in the wake of that conference, nations came together and spoke to me about confronting Qatar. Qatar seems to be in crisis as more Middle Eastern countries sever diplomatic ties with Doha, the nation's capital. Who in a sudden move are leading an Arab coalition cutting off Qatar by air and sea. Accusing Qatar of supporting terrorism. They do have a relationship with the Iranians. And meddling in the affairs of other Middle Eastern allies. Perhaps this will be the beginning of the end to the horror of terrorism. There can be no coexistence with this violence. Cutter was just going out of their minds at this speech. They didn't know what to do. Rather than come out and denounce the speech, though, like you would expect them to do, they came out in their charm offensive. A tiny Gulf state is redefining what it means to live, work, and play. Iconic Cutter, Saturday on CNN. They spent an untold amount of money within DC doing things like funding media operations. Some foreign governments falsely claim Qatar funnels money to terrorists. Fact is, we stand with the United States to defeat terrorism in all forms. They did do media buys targeting shows that they know the president watches, and also targeting the 45 or so Twitter accounts that they know the president follows. They will pay lobbyists and people who are close to the president, people who are close to other policymakers in the Pentagon and whatever, they'll send them on trips to Doha, and they even may put them on the payroll. And that's when they went to people like Nick Muzzin, right off Ted Cruz's staff. Ted Cruz, super friend of Israel, great contacts throughout the whole American Jewish community. Muzzin sets up this lobbying shop with no lobbying experience. 
immediately gets Cutter as a contract, making some outrageous amount per month. I, I heard, you know, six figures per month by pimping himself out as Ted Cruz's man on Jewish affairs. Boom, there's a whole new audience. Your pro-Israel, anti-jihadist, MAGA type conservatives. I don't know how someone who supports the Jewish people could wind up taking money from the Qataris. But he goes to them and says, hey, you want to come and visit? It's not a bad place. You want to meet the Emir? He's a great guy. He speaks English. You'll have a great time with him. Qatar really wants to have peace in the Middle East, and it's the single greatest sponsor of peace in the Middle East. You'll see parts of Qatar like you've never understood it before. And the jihadis in Qatar, when they want something from you, they're, they're super hospitable. And they might even be so hospitable that they're giving you some money under the table or otherwise funding your work. And lo and behold, they went on this charm offensive and came back with the idea that it would be the American Jews who would end up being the advocates for the jihadist regime in Qatar. There has never been a proper accounting of what happened in our community with the whitewashing of Qatar. Mm. The fact that that has not happened is an insult to the constituent members of our community who were played for fools. Because there are people supporting organizations that whitewash Qatar. And when your message to your people and your donors and your fans and your supporters is that you're there to support Israel and you're whitewashing some of Israel's foremost enemies who are funding the murder of Israelis, then there has to be an accounting. I think they were successful in that charm offensive because you did see the president back off Qatar. So you have now with the official U.S. line is no, no longer drive them out. It's let's all work together. And then National Security Advisor McMaster was promoting this as well, as well as different think tanks that were still on the take from Qatar. So for example, the Brookings Institution, one of the largest, oldest, most established think tanks in Washington, has accepted at least $24 million from Qatar. Brookings is massive, literally untold millions from foreign sources. You know, untold because they have a U.S. branch, which is subject to American finance and donation laws, and then they have a Doha branch in Qatar, which is subject to zero. So we have absolutely no transparency into how much is pouring into that branch. WikiLeaks released uh, kind of an amazing little cable, and the cable quoted a Qatari official claiming that Brookings is worth as much as an aircraft carrier to us which is kind of a tremendous thing. And at Brookings, we know the money changes their positions on things because we've heard from former fellows there that you know, they say, hey, the one thing you can't do is knock the Qatari government. They had to sign an agreement with that regime never to criticize it, never to allow any of its people to criticize it. If, if they are out there and people are coming to them for foreign policy advice, and nothing is going to be said negatively about the terrorist funding regime in Qatar, then that's a complete corruption of the U.S. national security decision-making process right there. And you can see this in the products they put out, in the events they sponsor, in the people they try to promote, and in the people they ignore. It's, yeah, it's a mix between taking the money and really believing these things. You have people who are kind of ideologically committed to political Islam as the solution. And when you really believe these things and you take the money, um, it's a very po powerful combination. I think that's what you see in Brookings. By some estimates, over 1,500 people have been hacked by Qatar. The hacking victims include dozens of Americans, including former DNC and Senate staffers, journalists, former European intelligence and defense officials, human rights activists, and even soccer players and Bollywood actresses. Top think tank officials in D.C. have also been hit by Qatar. The very real hacking threat by Qatar has made journalists afraid to cover Qatar. And in fact, I was warned that doing this documentary would come at great risk to my life, to my safety, and that I had better had, quote, everything locked down tightly because everyone knows there's a major threat from Qatar. Unfortunately, Qatar's hacking victims have no relief. Under various diplomatic and sovereign immunity doctrines, it's impossible for an American citizen to bring a viable lawsuit against a foreign government like Qatar. The only exception is if the American government authorizes a lawsuit, which unfortunately the United States government has refused to do. They are allowing Qatar to continue hacking and terrorizing Americans. 
It's past time for another amendment to the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, one that would allow a terrorism exception to the jurisdictional immunity of a foreign state. Whether this is physical terrorism or cyber terrorism, so long as Qatar sponsors terrorism, it should not be protected. We hear terms like information terrorists tossed along, and we're told that information terrorism and misinformation and hacking is a major threat. And of course, to some degree, all of that is true. But why is there no coverage of Qatar? Again, journalists are afraid to report on Qatar, and those who aren't are accepting blood money. If you look where the money goes, you'll see the same people who want to go easy on the Muslim Brotherhood and punish the Saudis. It's all the same amen chorus in Washington saying, oh, we have to, we have to isolate the Saudi regime, we have to push to remove the crown prince because he had Jamal Khashoggi murdered. Well, it's wrong to murder somebody, but the Turkish government has rounded up and killed far more journalists. And oh, by the way, Jamal Khashoggi himself was supported by the jihadist regime in Qatar. And because you have so many groups in town that are taking money from Qatar and direction from Qatar, we want you to defend Khashoggi's legacy against those who did him in, which means it's really a warfare between Qatar and Saudi Arabia that we're seeing right now. In a very real way, we're the lone superpower. Washington is like Rome, and everyone is trying to, I mean, not just the Qataris, but everyone is just trying to get their interests advanced in D.C. So Washington becomes a playground for desperate foreign interests, and the interest of the United States citizen gets gets kind of lost in this. I think everyone has a right to be heard. I think even foreign nations and, and their interests have a right to be heard because we are an open society. It's when you, when you take positions that are so obviously against the American national interest, that's a tremendous problem. Our open society in America wasn't prepared to deal with a threat like Qatar. Qatar is able to launder money through various think tanks and other institutions. They're buying up our academics, our media, this is happening right before our eyes, if only we would notice. But with more investigative journalism, more holding people accountable, more asking a lot of tough questions, the public is going to be more cognizant of it to the point where one would hope people will say, what's the source of this information? 